Opening a new school was a great adventure and filled with many interesting opportunities and challenges. None of the staff had worked together collectively and so we had to try to build that community as a staff and then realizing that essentially every student who walked in the doors the first day of school was unknown to all of us. And so not only did we need to know their name to begin with, we also needed to know who they were as students and learners. What was very important as we started the school was that we honored Elizabeth Finch, Betty Finch. She believed that every child could be successful. And so that is very much a vision of what the school is about. I care a lot. I'm in teaching because I really care about kids and I want to make sure every single one of them is learning to their full potential. But the challenge within that is some days I'm not sure that I am meeting the needs of every single child and how do I do that differently? And the needs are growing. More people coming in from other countries. So you have kids coming in that don't speak English. So you have that challenge. Then you have a learning challenge from, from a student that may or may not be identified. So we have to figure that out. So when you look at all the layers that teachers are teaching, I think it's an amazing job that we're asking them to do, but I think it's very complicated. Hi, it's good job. So. Creating a culture of inclusion from my perspective and what we what we try to do here is to not raise the needs or antennas of any child. Yes, some students look different. Some students act differently. But the goal is to include every single child. Collaboration does happen informally, but I also believe that I can support a culture of collaboration if I encourage it and support it with time. Our staff had indicated that they would like to have time to observe in one another's classrooms, both so that you're aware of where the students have come from and where they're going. So you'll have teachers from Division 1, 2 and 3 all in a staff family grouping. Together the group met and they outlined as a group what they wanted to experience. So they set their goals, what they hoped to do, um, created obviously relationships as they were working through that so that it was safe. I think collaboration is one of the most important pieces to the project. I also think that it is the most difficult for two factors. One, as teachers, we own what we do in a lot of ways. We own our classroom, the ambiance we create. We like to close that door. It's our world and it's scary to sit with your colleagues and put it out there and say, okay, this, this is what I'm doing. And I think talking with other professionals about your job, even though you're not teaching the same subject area at this school or the same grade level, is very beneficial because you can pull ideas from other classes. So for example, I went into a grade one classroom and got ideas, oh, this is what I could do in math for centers with my junior high kids that work well with grade one. I was given the opportunity to uh, collaborate and to see the actual progress of reading groups because I was interested but I had no idea of how to take it from the primary setting to, to junior high. I went and I watched our grade one teacher work and I was in awe by these little ones that just could mill about the room and do everything and I I was, I was scared, I was, wow, they're up and they're moving, there's like, no one's worried that anything is going to happen and you can be over there and, and be working on it and they're all doing their thing. And then I thought, okay, well this has to change by grade four. So then I went and I watched our grade four teacher and she sat and she had a lovely discussion with her students about self-monitoring and reading and how they figure out meaning and the rest of the class is sitting there working away. I think the research shows, and from my experience, students have to be reading at their instructional level. If they're trying to read material that's too hard for them, they don't learn, and they're not going to improve their reading skills. So with the flexible reading groups, you can make sure that every child is always reading something that's appropriate for them. A muddy spot. 
Is that at the beginning of the story? Me. No. So your the initial grouping happens because of their reading level, in order that they can handle the text, identify the words, and gain the understanding that they need. This side of the board is leveled groups, so the students are grouped by their reading level. This side is groupings that are mixed. So all of the other centers, they go to in a mixed group. That way there's a bit of support for the kids. They've got kids that can read everything that's at the center, and some kids that'll struggle a bit, so they can help each other. I think it's a lot easier in K-3 to for grouping. In junior high, it becomes more difficult. And part of the problem with junior high, I think, is that you will have the, the small group of students that will always contribute, and the other ones that are able to hide in the numbers. So getting them into smaller groups works because now they all have a voice. But in placing them in the groups in junior high especially, I think we have to be uh, understanding of who are they willing to voice their opinions with. So uh, in particular, I had some girls that I knew would, would shut down completely if they were placed in groups with certain boys. Um, and that's a big thing in grade seven. So it was about figuring out who will they work well with. Um, and that shifted groups as well so it was really a long process. I like working in a group because you get like a chance to like hear what everybody's saying and like you get more ideas. You get one-on-one -on -one time with um, Ms. Stadnik, our teacher. More work can be done and like the individual groups. And like when we're in a big group it means that like some of our ideas get out not all of our ideas so when we're in small groups all of our ideas get out and we can actually talk about it. They're used to reading groups, um, but they think that it's just based on reading level. And for some students, that now becomes a stigma when you get to junior high. And I was very open with them to tell them that there were a lot of factors that went into choosing the groups. We're all on the same reading level, and Ms. Stanek also decided that we should be in the same group with some of our friends, so it'd be easier for us to talk out in front of the group. Cooperation in the classroom functions in such a way that everybody gets to be part of the game all the time. If they were playing soccer, they wouldn't steal the ball from somebody and run off out of the game and rob them of the chance to score. All of a sudden, there's a community and they begin to work together. Uh, and there's a, there's a common destination, they want to get it. And they, they want to get it together. I, I feel like um, we could reach different goals with our reading comprehension, especially all together, where we could share our ideas. With There's, there really isn't any downtime in our class in terms of accomplishing what you can. They're free to move around and, and to ask another student. But again, at the beginning, we set guidelines on what that needs to look like, what that needs to sound like. There's a lot of scanning around the room just to make sure things are going well. Ten is ten. We just know that instead of wasting our time chatting, we should be doing work. If we don't have um, everything done, we would go to our binders and then finish the pages that we don't have done. And then once we're done, we can mark with a friend or something. And if you're done all your other work, you can read a book. It takes a lot of planning on the teacher's part. You have to be on top of things and make sure everything's prepared and ready. and. When the students go to work, it all has to be there and ready for them because you're busy with your group that you're with. And once things are up and running, it, it all runs quite smoothly. And orange group, you're reading around the room. Everybody knows where they're going? Okay, go ahead. The younger students, they're so adept at transitioning between tasks and been being able to do that well and that was the biggest struggle with the junior high students and probably every junior high teacher out there is going to go, oh, oh, I don't want them moving, I don't want them moving around, it, it will create chaos. Oddly enough, it only took a couple times and they got to it really well and I was actually amazed how capable they are doing it. And then the group uh, meeting with me is just, it's actually fabulous. It's just interesting in such a different way that I'd never experienced before. And here it's nice, they sit down and they just start talking. You know, you run through your questions, you have a few that hedge a bit and, and haven't done the work, but they realize it doesn't matter if nothing's written down because they're still going to have to answer some questions and they're still going to be there with you. That at the beginning, it's, he sees it as a power 
And that's going to be part of his transformation, realizing that it is a gift, because a gift is different than power how. We want all children in our classroom to see that they can be readers, they can be learners, that they can function as part of the class, and that, yes, their work page, for example, may be different from somebody else's, but that they have a role to play as a learner in our classroom. As we're working in the reading group, at the different levels, we would also be working on, you know, their speaking. They have to talk to me about the book, they answer questions about the book. Also, a lot of the follow-up activities will involve writing, so they might have some questions they need to answer about the book, they might have a sequence activity they need to do. One of the groups today was working on writing their own stories, similar to the stories they were reading. So. They all did a visual project based on their novel, so everybody was doing the same type of project, but a different novel as such. They'll all do a very similar writing task at the end, but with their own novel. Making a game board for our novel study peak. Negative events of the story will bring you black back. Some blocks and like positive events of the story will make you move on forward a bit more. There's big group instruction, and then smaller base, we're using your novel to do this. How are we gonna do that? And it makes it meaningful. As we've started using reading centers as a whole school, the students get used to that model and they understand that when they're at their independent centers, they're expected to work. They get used to the teacher being off with another group and having to focus on that group. And I think it's good for the students. They become more independent. They have to take on that role of taking charge of their own learning. The bigger skill that students learn in the group work is is community and dialoguing and, and sharing ideas and working with each other. And I think that is a skill that uh, is hard to teach, especially in a class size 30 plus. So in the grand scheme of things in, in life, they're going to have to learn to work with others and work with others in an effective way. And that's a really hard skill for students in junior high uh, because there's so many other things going on of who likes who and who doesn't want to work with anybody and who thinks their opinions are always right. A milestone in his life that he was a couple feet away from the summit of Everest. You have to be willing for the student to take some control, and that's the scariest thing possible, especially for a junior high teacher, to relinquish a little bit of control. But you do let go, and you focus on the five or six students that are in front of you, and you do it because that will be of more worth than running around the classroom trying to get everybody to do a worksheet. And ultimately, they know they have to do it because they're going to come and sit at that table soon with you and they're going to be accountable for it. You have yours? You have yours? And in a class size of 30 to 35, quite honestly, it's practically impossible. Reading groups are my next best option because I can put five, six of them in front of me at once. Grouping students according to their grade levels, abilities, is helping kids immensely. I've seen students working together, talking about what they're working on, sharing ideas, even on the lunchroom table. You can hear them talking about, this is what I did in my group today, and what did you do in yours, and they're excited about learning. Think, is this the same as other books I've seen, or is it a little bit different? When they're reading with me, I'm constantly assessing their reading skills. So while I'm teaching them reading strategies, I'm also assessing, is this book a good book for them? Is it a good level? Is it too easy? Do they need to move on to something harder? If I'm seeing in my notes that I've done that a couple of times, then they're ready to move on to a different group. And then I would just adjust the groups as need be. I think the students themselves understand that Assessment is not just one thing, one time that it's ongoing. At times there are questions that they need to hand in. At times I'm walking around the classroom, seeing what kinds of responses they're giving, talking to them about the thinking that's gone into their responses. And at times it's also reviewing samples of work and so that they can look at where they were and how they've journal. moved on. And guys, I don't mind which one you start with, as long as we keep working and eventually we get those things done. I think it's important that students are aware of metacognition in order that they realize that there really is a big thinking part of their work and that thinking through a task and how they're going to approach it helps them have more information about the kind of learner they are and how they can develop as an independent learner.
and that thinking about thinking is a part of our classroom. One of the ways to help students think about their thinking is to give them a choice of activities, see which ones they prefer to do, and then talk to them about why they felt that was easy for them. Did they notice the visual things? Were they better at reading? How did they put information together? What steps did they follow? Like some of the words are like long and I can't really like spell it out, so I just like split them up and then it helps me learn. Better. So we talked about um, doing an inventory. Is the kid better with like visual representation, auditory, kinesthetic? So how do kids learn best in your class? And so the students in their homerooms got to talk about why well, I learn best by, you know, reading out loud, or I learn best by doing something with my hands. So that includes everyone in the school population, just not the students with the special needs. It would target everyone. Because then the teacher knows that, hey, you know what, little Sally learns best by just listening to stories. So I'm gonna make sure that when I plan my lessons, there's gonna be some listening for her to do where little Joey, on the other hand, likes to read by himself. So now he can also listen and read as we go along in the stories. We do a lot of talking at the beginning of the year about how different people are good at different things and different people will be at different levels in everything. In math, somebody might be very good at soccer and someone else is not so good at soccer. So I think they're aware that Everyone is good at different things and everyone's going to progress at different rates. What are you doing? I'm counting. Well, actually, it's not really counting what you do at read around the room. It's actually you read things around the room. I think one of the important things that has come out of the last year and a half that our school has been opened is the sense of community that we've developed here. And I know sometimes that expression is overused, but we see it in a lot of ways in our school. We want everybody to feel that they have an opportunity to get to know many other students in their school and that whatever the interactions are, they're based on respect, they're based on fun, and also based on the sense that we've really started something here. We're all one great big huge family and um, no matter what type of learning that you are doing, you have an equal value within the school. The school makes you welcome. It, it just makes the children happy and they're caring and they're nurturing and empathy right, so when something goes wrong and they just open up and I think the teachers are just great. They really work well with the children, they inspire them, they challenge them, but they do it with fun and I think that's what counts. They're taught respect and they take pride in their school. It's interactive and there's open communication with the parents and I think that's very important. It's, it's a really awesome school and it's really fun. I really enjoy this coming to here every day. We care about each other. It's like it's a family. It's so many people working together to make it the most successful for students to do things that you weren't able to do before. What's different? Christy, what's different about these two pages? There have been lots of successes in two years. And I will come back to again when you have very capable and competent people caring for students and children, great things can happen. And I believe that staff here all view all kids as all of ours. It's not just the grade three teachers' children. They're my children too, and we each look after each other's. To learn more about what Edmonton Public Schools is doing to support inclusion, visit us online at epsb.ca backslash inclusive learning.